So my talk today is about uh, Japanese knotweed and um, it in particular is I think a pretty interesting um, scenario um, because of the um, uh, cross boundary, um, uh, cross jurisdictional um, partnerships that have been developed. And um, I consider that the lifeline for navigating this, the, the success of this project. And I look forward to telling you more about it. Um, Japanese knotweed is uh, known to be the 10th most invasive species or plant in the world. Um, you know, whether it's 10th, 11th, or 12th, I think there are probably different lists out there, but it's, in other words, very, very invasive. Um, my background a little bit is that I've worked for the California Exotic Plant Management Team since 2002. I work with 13 California national parks, and, uh, and it, it's part of a system of uh, EPMT programs across the country. The National Park Service has 17 EPMTs, and um, we serve a, a, approximately 290 of the over to 400 national park units working with parks on their invasive plant issues. Uh, next year is our 20th anniversary celebration coming up. So stay tuned for some activities. So why I consider Japanese knotweed a problem is a number of reasons. And it was described to me early on when I got involved in this project by Noah Booker uh, and Eric Rubel. The three of us had a, a conference call about it and he went into describing why. And it's one, it, it gives a pulse of growth early in the season. It's an aggressive colonizer on a wide variety of substrate. It spreads by rhizomes up to six feet, or six, actually 60 feet horizontally and six feet deep. And a fragment the size of your fingernail can form a new plant and can grow eight feet of rhizome in one season. So what that ends up doing is that it creates this situation in the environment that it gradually eliminates trees by out-competing out seedlings. And in our case, along a very valuable riparian corridor. And I'll tell you more about that. It, it, it essentially will out-compete the seedlings. So there'll be a loss of lar large woody debris and streams and a loss of nitrogen input from the alders and other trees. And then it also increases erosion and turbidity in the winter. All that's left in the winter when we get the high flows are these stalks, these naked stalks that don't hold down the banks well. And the creek becomes more and more incised. So over time, creek temperatures will increase due to siltation and a lack of shade. And it reduces the ecosystem stability by or the characteristics that stabilize the ecosystem. And in this case, if it reduces the temperature of the creek, then it will basically eliminate the habitat for um, uh, what is a, um, a very valuable, and it's actually the southernmost population of coho salmon. So the range of characteristics throughout the season are pretty impressive. I was out last week and um, the picture in the middle at the bottom is I didn't see any flowering, but I saw some leaves that were that large. And then I also found new starts that resembled the, the, the lower right. Um, even though in the spring, summer, typically though, you would see um, in the spring, the, the, the early starts are the, the, the red leaves, etc. And then the summer and fall have red speckled stems with nodes and, the, and a shield shaped leaf with a flat base. So it, um, my word of caution here is to um, just make sure you're looking for all different morphs of it throughout the season. Though. And, and, you know, where will it grow? Um, basically, where won't it grow is a bigger question, I think, um, or more, um, a less um, verbose, and there'd be a less verbose answer because I, there's just, a, I don't see deserts on this list. But, you know, I wouldn't put it past it. It's amazingly um, adept at occupying all kinds of substrates. So um, I looked it up in EdMaps and uh, uh, Japanese knotweed is known to occur in 43 different states. 
and it also is, um, it occupies, I think it's like eight Canadian provinces. It um, is pretty widespread. And I, I looked at another site this morning and I couldn't count up the number of countries. It, so it's basically known worldwide. Um, it's eight Canadian provinces. And then in California here, um, Cal Weed Mapper has it um, identified in 31 counties. And um, where the, the site that I'm talking about today is uh, identified in the left circle, um, that's Marin County. And um, there are two populations in the state that have been eradicated. So this image here, the next slide, is um, a close-up of the, 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 where it's found in Marin County. And this is West Marin, if people know Marin County. Um, and it goes from, in the lower right corner, um, you can see the, um, the text there shows, in the upstream most portion is the private homeowner section, which we don't know a lot about um, right now. Um, we started some surveys and some outreach there, and more about that later. And then there's the state park population, and then there's the national park population, which is the downstream population. Um, it is basically smack dab right on top of the coho salmon critical habitat. That's the map in the upper left where the red zone is. So it's basically an identical area. So if you look in the upper left hand corner of that upper left map, uh, that's Tomales Bay. And that's um, about a 17 mile bay. It is not known to uh, occupy the lower stretch of Lagunitas Creek or Tomales Bay, but it, it could actually migrate out there. And that's one of our, one of our threats for sure. So why eradication? Um, eradication I use um, seldom when I talk about invasive species, a lot of times uh, all that we can do is control it and keep it at bay. But in, you know, I do believe that we are at a spot where there is a chance that we could eradicate this population. Uh, it is, um, and, and why I say that is that I think that the populations are one responding well, what we are, the ones that we are treating are responding quite well, we're having a lot of success. And when I talk to people around the country, I've, ref I've talked to many counterparts back east, northwest, and the folks that have it, that have had it for more than 10 years, we are in a very enviable position. So this is the timeline, essentially, is, is when I felt like we were basically starting off. When I started off and sort of jumped on the wagon here, it, uh, if you will, at some, in 2011, I had heard that there was an initial, initial knotweed observation in Cal Flora that was brought to my attention by Eric Rubel with the, with the National Park Service Inventory Monitoring Program. He published it in a newsletter, and I, he and I consequently started talking about it after that and um, started strategizing about what would be best. In 2012, um, at the very same time, in the same stretch, there's um, a salmon winter habitat restoration project that's, that's, that was started back in 2011-2012 and um, it took them about five years of planning to move forward with their, their process. So we are, we're essentially moving along in kind of in a, a, a similar path but we weren't aware of each other's activities at the time. So by 2014 and 16, um, through 16, we started off with partial surveys and manual treatments of both state and national parks. And the RCD, the Resource Conservation District, um, started handing out um, information bulletins. And so in 2016, uh, the initial Japanese knotweed meeting was held in, in Marin with the Marin resource managers. And we began a, a strategy development. Who all was interested? Did managers, were they concerned about it spreading? Um, and I was really impressed with just how receptive folks were right off the bat. 
far as hearing about it, as far as even if it wasn't on their land, they were very interested in making sure it was addressed as quickly as possible. Um, we also started researching techniques and compliance for herbicide use along this stretch. The, the, the techniques that essentially after about a year, year of researching, I was not able to find uh, any classic examples of, or any examples of, of knotweed eradication at the scale that we're working with. And then, um, so we feel pretty firmly that um, herbicide was a critical tool in the toolbox at this juncture. And um, so in 2017, we also, uh, the, the, the Moran Resource Conservation District and the UC Extension Outreach did some, um, did a, uh, a, a few, a handful of outreach activities. Um, one was bringing down the Matoll Restoration Council folks that have dealt with this, a similar type of population up in the Humboldt area. And then we also, um, we're able to um, complete our compliance and do our first full survey and herbicide treat in 2017. And the salmon habitat projects um, began also in 2017. In 2018, I think the, the group that, that met initially in 16 and 17 became formal. We, we were, we, um, had some really pivotal meetings at the county office and um, felt like it was time to actually create a name for the group and become a little more strategic about how we were going to work together. And so we, we, um, we uh, that, that's the group in the lower left, photograph in the lower left, that's, that was a meeting um, just a week ago uh, working on our five-year action plan. And, and hammering out some of the things that we'd like to see. Um, the county role in 2018 expanded um, impressively. I was incredibly pleased with, with their, their um, um, the, the way they were able and willing to step up to the table. And then um, in particular, as it relates to private lands. Um, and then in 2018, um, we continued surveys and treatments in the National Park and State Park. And a, a milestone, I believe, was we were able to initially treat 11, 11 sites on private land. So there were 26 surveys and 11 sites that were, um, that were basically surveyed and treated on private lands. So this next slide is, the, uh, is a map of, on the far left, of the Japanese knotweed populations in 2018. Um, we have 39 sites at present that are known. And we also have, um, as I mentioned before, the salmon habitat restoration projects. They are basically in the very same stretch. Um, this year we'll have five projects that'll be going on. Um, each of the salmon habitat, habitat projects or most of the habitat projects are involve a fair amount of earth movement. And so we have um, worked very carefully with the entities that are doing these projects to um, reduce or minimize the knotweed um, or the impacts to knotweed and the possibility of moving that material around. As I said, um, seven grams of material or a, a, the size of your fingernail of material of a rhizome can actually start a new population. So one of the things that um, they really, uh, in one of the projects, they really wanted to go straight through a, a known patch. Um, when I say straight through, they wanted to install a side channel that ran through this patch. And so um, in order to do that, um, the only known method of manually dealing with it was to actually excavate the material to get those rhizomes out of there. Um, a number of projects have not been successful with tarping, um, and this is the kind of thing that it would be uh, a channel be running straight through it. So that the slide on the right uh, shows the excavation that occurred and the burial of the material. It was excavated and buried to 15 feet. Um, this is modeled after what they that what they require in England. 
Um, if they are to um, move any knotweed around, it has to be excavated um, and buried to 15 feet. So in 2017 and 18, the, the, here are our season stats in terms of miles of survey um, or creek surveyed, um, the number of sites that we um, have had, and then um, the acres treated, et cetera. And I, I'd like to stress here that we're doing the same level of survey, which is the complete stretch within the national park. And the number of sites have gone up because one, we have actually um, refined our mapping and, and broken apart a site. We have actually merged a couple of sites. Um, it's not surprising that the number would go up because we still have quite a bit of treatment up um, north of us, or not up north, but um, upstream of us. And, um, and so the sites have gone up. However, the numbers have gone down dramatically. Um, we've gone from over 8,000 stems down to um, a little over 600 stems. So um, I'm really pleased with that. And I think another thing that this slide shows is the, um, the volume of herbicide that use that was required. Because we were so effective with our herbicide treatment in 2017, we went from using essentially 77 acres of glyphosate to zero. We decided through adaptive management that we could consider the dropping of glyphosate altogether because of our, our herbicide success rate was 95%. And we um, dropped it to um, only using Amazapir. And both of these are aquatically approved formulations. And um, the, so the Amazapir dropped, as you can see, 15.35 ounces to just a, an ounce and a quarter of material. So I um, am extremely pleased with the success that we've had. And I think that is also a, a strong, just, just strong rationale for um, moving in early, um, treating as with the best possible tool you can, so that you can actually knock it back while it's in its, in its early stage and use very little herbicide. And so the, the, the Marin Knotweed Action Team that was formed, it, we've got a number of partners here, the Marin County Parks, Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, the National Park Service, both Golden Gate and, and Point Reyes National Seashore, the County of Marin, uh, California State Parks, UC Extension, um, a cooperative extension, uh, the Marin Municipal Water District, and the Marin Resource Conservation District. Um, this is an, an incredibly um, pivotal part of the success of this project. And so, one of the, when I said that the county really stepped up um, to work with the, the, the private homeowners, one of the things that um, they were um, able to do after several years of discussions and, um, and outreach, um, they were, because it is an A-rated weed, uh, there is, there, or there are regulations that support um, uh, the county declaring a site as, as essentially um, it's an eradic they've, they've declared it an eradication area, which ultimately will um, uh, is enables the county to step forward and require treatment. Um, so this is a really helpful tool. It is not something that is used often at all, but in the in this particular case, when you've got so much at risk, it's a really important tool. So some of the challenges. Um, so I think that, you know, in the long term, making sure that outreach and communications are proactive across jurisdictions. And what I mean by that is also that we are making sure that we're talking to our neighbors, we're talking to the community, we're talking to the uh, regulators, we're talking to each other in terms of managers um, and, and making sure that um, we are um, listening as well. And then, um, Sustaining the, the MCAT member momentum so that treatments will be in sync with a strategically focused and what I call a finite eradication window. I say it's finite because if this, if we are not in sync and we do not move quickly, 
quickly, meaning over the course of the next five to 10 years to really make a significant break in this, then eradication will be, on, be beyond our ability to control and treatments will be um, uh, in a much more prolonged state. And funding and staffing requirements over time. Um, I know the Park Service generally works in terms of three-year funding cycles and sometimes they're three or four years out before you can get funding and, and, and sometimes the county can get funding that year and so that's one of the things as an organization, the MCAT organization that we're going to be working with is to make sure that you know we're paying attention to each other and, and that we're all sort of moving forward together. And then surveying and treatment detection success. Um, it is a um, uh, it's a it's a um, complicated environment, and um, so that's one of the challenges we have in front of us. And um, bringing a diverse collection of stakeholders together in an efficient but mindful way. And as I stressed before, that listening is a really big part of this. And some of the lessons, and this is a bit of a list, a list, so I'm going to crank through them pretty quickly. But some of the lessons that I think are important to share are that. Manual methods have typically been unsuccessful due to the active rhizomes, and it can, it can easily contribute to spreading the species. So if you are doing manual treatments on your, you know, wherever you are, um, I would highly recommend um, uh, being extremely careful with those fragments. So to, to get in quick, and this particular is to get in quick, knock it down with an efficient method, met, an efficient method the longer you wait, the greater the need, and the less likely you'll be able to eradicate. And annual surveys and treatments would be needed in perpetuity at that play, at that particular time. So stem injections, they tend to be much more, um, that require what much more herbicide than foliar, uh, even though it seems very specific, you know, you're injecting right into the stem, you use a much higher concentration. And um, the managers that I have spoken to around the country have said that they would not use it uh, primarily because it uses way more herbicide per footprint. And then plan for adaptive management that responds to your success in site conditions. Um, as we move forward with our evaluations every year, one of our primary things we're doing is looking at how can we reduce the amount of herbicide that we're using and retain the goal that we're shooting for. We've seen four inch specimens along, alongside newly emerging, or foot four foot ones alongside newly emerging specimens, so keep looking for it. Keep your, 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 um, your visual cues or your visual targets, you know, from sprouts to mature plants. Um, it can appear to be gone one year um, after a year of treatment, two years of treatment, but it could reemerge a year or two later, so keep monitoring. And involve all relevant parties as early on as possible. Um, it, it's, we've got a lot of stakeholders in this particular case from the Lagunitas Creek Technical Advisory Committee. There's a strong focus on, on uh, protecting salmon and the, the health of the creek in this particular case. Early on, we went to the advisory committee. We, at this group of us, went, went to the advisory committee and were successful. In, um, and they have actually identified it as a as a, uh, as a matter of, of, of an endorsement, they have created an actual statement that they endorse the treatment of Japanese knotweed. And, and involve all relevant parties. Um, so um, basically the county ag, county supervisors, fishery biologists, et cetera. It's kind of nice when you can see, um, you know, fishery biologists right at the same table, as, as interested as you are, in treating this species. And let your county ag department know if you've seen it and get, um, it's really important to let people know about it, in, in particular your county ag department. And if you um, are intending on moving any kind of soil around, you know, double check with the county what is their um, advised technique. Um, and use extreme caution if you're disturbed in the site. Um, it's really important to map, flag, and take photos of the site of each site. Um, even do you know, you know, in, in it's it's quite difficult to navigate this landscape. So we even do, even tracked our our footsteps through so we can actually understand where we're accessing the sites, etc. 
And it's super easy the next year to go back to the sites if you've got it well flagged and well marked. And as you are tracking these numbers, um, we have basically suggested that you track numbers of stems if you on a site if you have less than 600. And it's been really helpful to us so we can articulate with some sense of security how much our numbers are going down. And consider budgetary needs across the boundaries and share what you're finding with others and make sure neighbors know to be on the lookout. And vigilance is the number one. Vigilance and, and making sure that you're, you've got open communications with your partners. So I feel like as I wrap this up that we are poised for success. This MCAT group, the meeting from just last week, we took a picture of a subset of us out there in front of the building and I just am so excited to, 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 to work with these individuals. Um, it is, um, it's a real honor um, and I feel like we've got a lot of talent and I have a lot of hope. I think that the good news is that um, we don't have the more aggressive bohemian or giant knotweed. We have an observed Japanese knotweed in the lower four miles of Lagunitas Creek or in Tamales Bay yet. And we've dramatically reduced our herbicide use just after one year of treatment. Um, and if we're diligent with our surveys and in sync with our treatments, we could see eradication, I think, within, within less than a decade. Now, that is my goal, that's my hope, um, and I'm gonna stick to that. Um, and I'll leave you with what I would consider to be the most important element, which I've mentioned several times, is remembering to keep our eyes on the prize, look at the broader landscape and the value of what we're doing, and continue fostering the critical partnership with MCAT and the community or with your partners in your community. And then a special thank you to these individuals. Um, I have um, felt very lucky to work with this group and I will open it up. I believe we've got a few of you um, that are within MCAT on, on the line. One person in particular that I'd like to call out is um, uh, the new coordinator in 2019, MCAT hired the new co coordinator, um, Anna Dirksy, and um, uh, she has started um, as of January and has just hit the ground running. So, Anna, um, can you unmute, can Anna Dirksy? Yes, I, I un unmuted myself there. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I'd like to just introduce you and, and, and say, ask you to speak you know, a, a little bit about your experience of your first six months. Yeah, so um, my role with MCAT has been to target the private landowners, and I work through UC Cooperative Extension as being sort of a good independent party to do that, um, working with those private landowners. And those are on the San Geronimo Creek, which is about two, two and a half miles um, upstream of Samuel P. Taylor and the NPS lands. Um, and as Bobby said, you know, the, the idea that this all needs to be done together in concert to make it an effective eradication strategy. Um, so I've been um, doing outreach events and, um, and doing a talk tomorrow and then um, Monday as well with community groups within the San Geronimo Valley. Um, and then as well as some, a lot of um, letters and right now door knocking. So I've surveyed over 30 parcels this spring um, and found an additional seven Japanese knotweed from last year's total of uh, 26 parcels surveyed and 11 that were um, treated with 15 that were found with Japanese knotweed. So there is still more Japanese knotweed that we're finding in the valley. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, David? I don't... There's a... <laughs> Barbara's computer is right next. Okay, it stopped it. Now I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, oh, oh. I don't know how. Why don't you I, go downstairs I, where you can't hear this? <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm I'm muting Barbara. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> the 
this is impossible. No, it's right next to the phone. I can trying to. Uh, I'm trying to mute Barbara. For some reason, it's not working. I'd like to just say one quick thing about Anna. Um, it was really. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, but I, you know what? I'm just for a second here. I'm going to mute everyone. Okay, great. And I'm going to unmute Absolutely. Anna and Bobby and Doug again. Okay, great. Leave meeting. Leave meeting. Okay. No. there and I'm ha ah, I'm just failing here um, everyone else should be muted okay this is I just want to tell a little teeny anecdote uh, yes it was uh, yesterday I was driving to the office and I see this halfway to the office is a giant sign that says not my wedding group and Monday, June 10th, giant sign. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what's up? And it was Anna's. I, I sent her an image of it. And I was so excited to hear Anna's holding a meeting. It was very great press. Good job, Anna. I, I'm, I, yeah, that, the planning group put the uh, sign up. Um, so they've been instrumental um, in helping to arrange that. And then, yeah, it's may, it's mostly, you know, keeping to try to make more and more connections within the community and getting more people on board. Fantastic. Great. Okay, so we have some questions here. And I apologize, we do seem to be having some technical difficulties that I'm doing well solving. Um, uh, but two questions that we have here, um, Yuda Berger, um, I think she's still in uh, our uh, asked how effective excavation was. Excavate, great question. And it, uh, we have not seen any resprouts whatsoever. We were extremely careful. We even had them, when they moved the material into the pit, that they had to travel about 60 feet from the, from the actual site to the pit. And we had them scrape the top three inches and then pile that to the side, we parked that and came back. And there was, yeah, and, and so in both the pit situation and the pile, zero, not leave. Hello, please leave a message. Guys, I'm having a, uh, I apologize here. I'm trying to mute everyone and it's not letting me do it. <clears throat> What's strange is it looks like I've got a little sign saying it. they are muted. I know. <clears throat> I know. I'm having all kinds of, all kinds of Zoom challenges. I can't figure out how to get out of this. All right, let me, let me. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, if you can hear us and you would like to leave the meeting, scroll around till a menu comes up on the bottom of your screen, go all the way to the right, and you should see a red, the red words, leave meeting. Click on that, a window will pop up and say yes. All that said, it seems like the audio is a little better now. I'm gonna launch this quick poll before, uh, before folks have to leave us here. And again, apologies about uh, any issues. Another couple of questions here. Susanna Manning asks whether county agriculture is acting as your CEQA lead? I'm actually, I work with NEPA, so I cannot say that. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Okay. Bobby, this is Doug. Are, are you so far working on federal property only? Yes, I am, yes. I see, and I'm, it sounds like though there's a lot of uh, infestation on private property as well. Um, so I'm curious how you're working on that and, and 
uh, what, what the permitting requirements are in terms of NEPA and or CEQA. And Anna, I've unmuted you as well, since I think that's a big part of your position. Yeah, so um, the County Ag Department is the one that's been primarily working on that. Um, Stefan Parnay, um, and I, I know that I've reported back a few things for, for those as far as what they're doing. Um, I believe, I know the categorical exemption was granted on the public lands, if I'm not mistaken, Bobby. Right, and then... Um, and that's the similar... And the state been, I know the state offer. works is 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 working with CEQA as well and and uh so Samuel P. Taylor State Park is working with CEQA. Um but and then as far as the question of recruiting private landowners to participate um we're focused on Creekside landowners obviously um primarily the the question of whether um surveying tributaries eventually as well um but we basically have a um, you know, list of addresses of creeks that, of properties that adjoin the creek and um, started with a, a letter mailing. Um, and now I'm following up with that with the door knocking and phone, phone campaign. Hi, I just want to break in for a minute. I, boy, I just, apparently this is what happens when you really overcommit yourself. I apologize for the technical issues. I did launch the wrong poll initially. Please, um, if you took the poll already, Please take it again if this doesn't look like the questions that you saw before. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, does anyone else have uh, questions they'd like to add to the chat? While people are thinking and maybe typing, uh, typing this is Doug, um, curious about the um, how long you have been treating. I know the timeline started in 2011. You showed some information on um, treatments for 2017, 2018, but like like you acknowledged, uh, knotweed is known for kind of hanging out for a couple of years and then popping back up. So it's great to hear that there's a lot of monitoring going on. Do you have a sense for how the trajectory of the project for the sites that you have been able to treat, um, whether you feel like you can say with confidence that they are eradicated or how long you're, you'll be going back to confirm that they aren't going to pop back up? It's a, it's a fair question. Um, and the honest answer is that we will keep monitoring it. Um, I, I think it needs to be monitored for another five to 10 years. The ones, and, and we, and, and I, in my discussions with folks that are working with more extensive populations, when they bring it to zero, sometimes they'll skip a year or maybe even two years of a survey um, and then go back and check it again. So, um, you know, so it's, there is a way to sort of not have the workload be as, as significant. The survey is the most significant part of the process. Once you've gotten the compliance behind you and once you've gotten, you know, um, I. Yeah, the, the, the survey is the hardest part. And then as far as um, prior to 2017, there were manual treatments, but it wasn't based on a complete survey. It was sort of op opportunistic surveys that were done and there were manual treatments that, um, it reduced the population, um, but it's not something that I think, um, it wasn't, um, performed at the rate that is recommended, like basically treating it every two weeks, um, and um, it would need to go on for quite a long time. And I don't, yes, there's just, it's, yeah. Um, and it's, in some cases, um, it's a bit more like mowing. Um, you're just trimming off the top, and over time, you know, maybe if you have a small enough population and it's a very isolated one population, if you have like one individual site, I would consider manual treatment possibly. Um, so I'm not 100% against the manual treatment, but if you've got any kind of complexity to it or numbers of sites, then I think it kicks it into a, an herbicide. Well, and speaking of that, knowing that Marin is um, pretty cautious about using herbicides. Have you had any um, occasion to present 
your approach and um, have people decide, okay, this is this is okay, or is it because it's on Park Service land so far, kind of outside the realm of public comment? Um, I think it's pretty widely known what we are doing. Um, we've been interviewed by the papers, and and um, there have been um, conversations with the, the 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 county supervisor and and. Um, uh, I, it's 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 definitely um, something that people could weigh in if they want. I mean, it, like I say, it's not a, it, it's not a hidden thing at all. Um, we've been quite upfront about it. Great, good to hear. Okay, anyone else? Questions? It's, I have to say, it's really, it's really neat to kind of hear what's going on in other parts of the state too. And, and. Yeah, I, I have one more point. I think that um, one of the things, I did get a phone call from somebody that I um, was, um, that was um, curious about herbicide use. Um, and um, so, this gentleman and I talked for about an hour. And um, when I talked to him about basically our overall objective and the number of sites, 39 sites sounds like a lot. But if you look at the actual number of net acres that we've got, it's extremely small. So with that said, and then when you bring it down to using herbicide to the tune of 1.25 ounces, across these 39 sites. Um, it puts it in perspective, I think. And then another thing that I failed to, to point out early on in the map of the, at, at the very beginning, there were a couple of maps that were shown. And on those maps, there's tons of dots. And it looks like it's more than it is because of the scale, essentially, for one. And number two, um, it is because um, one dot would probably cover an acre almost, and you know it really represents like 50 plants or something. So, so there's that, and then there are that is directly from Calflora that has multiple observations um, um, over a series of years of the same site. So it looks it's a little misleading, um, but. Um, uh, I think that over time, we're getting it more and more refined in terms of our mapping and our understanding of what the, the, the um, distribution is. And um, I have a lot of confidence that that, um, that is something that can be managed within Marin County. And it's not something many counties can say, so. Yeah. Right, Doug, do you have any any last thoughts that you want to share with the group? No, just thank you very much for tuning in and uh, realize that California Invasive Species Action Week is through Sunday and uh, events are happening around the state. So if you're curious, take a look on um, the state's webpage for the Department of Fish and Wildlife for California Invasive Species Action Week. And you can also take a look at um, youth art posters. I think they are currently posted in the state capitol. Um, but there's a, a poster contest on invasive species. Yeah, I'll just I'll just show that for a minute here, and we can take a look. Um, oh well, we can see we can see last year's winners. Hmm. Well, some videos. Nice. Oh, cool. Ha, huh, I like the snake head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh. There we go. Nice, they got the, uh, they got the lines right. There's some fierce teeth. 